live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. All right, everybody, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Science Cafe in the Daily Planet Cafe at the Nature Research Center of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I hope you're excited to be here tonight for the Science Cafe. All right, good. I never know if that's going to work or not, so thank you. But yeah, glad that you're all here for the Science Cafe. Happy New Year! This is the first time I'm seeing you in the cafe since we rolled over into 2018. So I hope that your holidays went great, that you are celebrating a wonderful new year, and that I wish you all of your resolutions that you make it to February 1. You've at least got a few more weeks before you have to give them up. But yeah, welcome to Science Cafe. Of course, we're here every Thursday night in the Daily Planet, bringing science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art in the world of science, even that to the stage of the cafe to give you a chance to see what's going on in the world around you. How does science apply to our daily lives? And who are the really cool and interesting people who are doing this really interesting work? We've got lots of interesting events coming up at the museum and a few off-site of the museum that I do want you to know about. So you can get out your smartphone or your pencil and paper, get ready. I'm about to give you a lot of cool stuff you don't want to miss. Number one, February 23rd, if you are a fan of authors John Grisham or John Hart, if you like those novels, you like those authors, February 23rd, we are hosting a special evening with both of them on the stage at the Duke Energy Center just down the road from us. Tickets are available for that one online at Ticketmaster and at the Duke Energy Center box office. And your ticket includes a free copy of John Hart's newest book, newest book called The Hush. So you don't want to miss that one. And proceeds from that event, we're doing this event with these authors to support the Museum of Natural Sciences. So proceeds from that are going to be coming back to support scientific research programs here at the museum. So you can go check that out and know that you're doing a really good thing for us in 2018 that we appreciate. Next week here at the Science Cafe, January 11th, we have 18th, tonight's the 11th, January 18th. We have a special lecture, so we won't be here in the cafe. We'll be in the WRAL 3D Theater, so in the other building of the museum on the first floor. Join us for a special lecture with Lee DeGatkin, who's written a book, How to Tame a Fox. You may have heard, because uh, these stories sort of sift through the news every now and then, about research experiments in Siberia where they work to tame foxes through selective breeding and things like that. Anybody heard of this? Industry? Okay, yeah, I see lots of hands going up. Well, he's written a new book all about this research in collaboration with one of the lead scientists of that project. He's going to be talking about the research and his book, and you can pick up a copy and get it signed by the author next Thursday night, 7 o'clock, in the WRAL 3D Theater. So, a couple of really cool opportunities that you don't want to miss out. Oh, and if you're a fan of comics and astrophysics, those two things go together, I promise. Uh, we'll have Jorge Cham, who's the author of PhD Comics, Piled Higher and Deeper Comics. PhD students are normally pretty familiar with his work. His work details life as a PhD student, uh, doing graduate work, and then trying to make it in academia. Really awesome stuff. It, it applies to just about anybody's life, wherever you're at. Uh, but he's going to be on the stage doing some live cartooning, while Daniel Whiteson, who's an astrophysicist, is going to talk to us about some of the great unknowns in astrophysics, what we know that we know nothing about. So that's going to be a really exciting night, and that's right before the Astronomy Days weekend, the 27th, 28th. So I hope you got all of that. If you didn't, naturalsciences.org is where you can get more, because there's a lot of cool stuff coming up in the next couple of months here at the museum. Tonight, for the Science Cafe, we've brought a special guest all the way from Durham. <laughs> which, 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 uh, not from Great Britain. Just, just up this, just up the street. I don't normally have hecklers in my audience, uh, but from Duke University, from the Duke Institute for Brain Sciences, we have Dr. Nicole Shram Sapeta, who is the assistant professor of the practice and the chief operating officer of 
Dibs, Duke Institute for Brain Sciences, and I must give Dibs applause because they actually sponsored tonight's Science Cafe. So please put your hands together for Dibs. Thank them for partnering with the museum to allow us to bring you really excellent content, top of mind. Did anybody see uh, the special, I was told it aired last night on WRAL about the opioid crisis, opioid addiction. It was on the news, okay. It was on last night's news, maybe, maybe not. But who's seen this stuff in the news? I don't think you can miss it, right? It, it, it's all over the place. It affects a lot of people. And our governments, local governments, state governments, federal governments are trying to figure out what to do about it. And one of the people that at least I think they should be talking to, and that I hear they are talking to, is Dr. Sham Cepeda. So put your hands together. Welcome to the stage. Our guest for tonight, Dr. Nicole. All right, good evening. Thanks to all of you for braving that rainy weather, and I hope no one else had to brave I-40 on a rainy January night. Uh, <laughs> it's worth it, you guys look great already, but um, wow, that was a drive. Uh, and I heard that there were some students from NC State Scholars Program, is that correct? I wanna give you a huge shout out, because I was in that program a long time ago. So thank you for coming, this is really exciting. <laughs> all right. Um, this topic, as you will soon find out, is very near and dear to my heart, and uh, I don't want to stand up here and just lecture and drone on and say what I want to say. I want to answer the questions that you have. So feel free to raise your hand if, if you have a question, a small tangent you want to go off on during the talk. Um, please do interrupt. I really prefer interruptions rather than just droning on myself. Uh, and uh, Chris and Katie will help with the microphones if we need to do that for the recording for the audience. All right, so I entitled my talk From the Brain to Society and Back because what I learned over the years of my work in the drug addiction area, I started very, in a very molecular, very basic level, started doing animal modeling, and what always fascinated me about drug addiction is this idea that this molecule, I started studying cocaine when I was in grad school, and I can draw this molecule, and I'm so proud that I can take my organic chemistry knowledge and draw this molecule, and then I can figure out what it does in the brain, and then that made me ask, well, how does it do that to individuals and families and society? So that's what really has always fascinated me about drug addiction, that these very simple molecules can have such a profound effect on humans and our interactions in our society. So that's why I titled the talk the way that I did. Is it gonna go? <laughs> oh, I forgot to turn off. Details. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So this is the question that this is the, a really important place to start the con any conversation about drug addiction, and everyone thinks that they have an answer to this question. But just shout out what you think. What is the difference between a patient? with addiction and a recreational drug user. Many of us have had a glass of wine. I personally have had many glasses of wine with dinner over time, but I'm not an alcoholic. Um, but So what's the difference between someone who can take an addictive substance and walk away from it and have a good time versus someone who goes down that path to the very negative pathological effects of addiction? What are your observations? They stop. Right, withdrawal symptoms or something that goes along with addiction. What else? Maybe depression. Depression, so very often goes along with addiction. I see some in the back there. They'll make unreasonable sacrifices just to get the next hit. Right, yeah, the, the extreme behavioral changes that will go along with seeking that drug. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the people know like their limit, and the other person does not. Mm -hmm. The limits of taking the drug, right. Yeah, one person can stop and the other one can't. Right. So let's talk a little bit more um, about, so the, the question, the underlying question is, obviously, taking drugs does not make everyone addicted. What is the difference? So I want to get pretty 
one thing, addiction is also a word that everybody kind of thinks they know what it means, but I want to talk about what it means in the clinical sense. This is the definition that I like to refer to. Addiction is a primary chronic neurobiological disease. I underline the word primary because if you think about all other, all the, you know, the major medical issues of our time, they're very complex. If you have, if someone has diabetes and has diabetic foot ulcers, which of those two conditions is primary? The diabetes itself, exactly. The foot ulcers are secondary to the diabetes. So if someone has cancer and needs to be on chronic opioids to manage that cancer pain, obviously the cancer is primary. And even though they have to take drugs every day to function, they're not addicted. Um, so when addiction, when, when the getting and seeking and taking and recovering from the drug becomes the actual problem, that's when we're talking about addiction. We're not talking about a patient who needs the drug to function. What I tell my students is if the drug gives you back your life functions, that's good medication. If the drug takes away your life functions, that's addiction. And many of the behaviors that come along with addiction are including, as we talked about earlier, impaired control over drug use, compulsive use, continued use despite harm and craving. So as someone said earlier, um, someone who is using the drug to the detriment of their other normal helpful behaviors, that impaired control, using it despite harm, using it without thinking, that's what I'm talking about when I say addiction, not just needing the drug to function because of other pain, illness, whatever, depression. We'll talk about depression in a little while. So one key point that I already made, but let's share some statistics, is that not all drug takers become addicted. About 11% of people who ever take a drink of alcohol go on to become alcoholics. About 4% of people who ever try marijuana or cocaine go on to become addicted to those substances. About 7% of opiate users go on to become addicted to those. And that includes the prescription and the, the street illegal opiates. So what is the difference between those small percentages, 5, 10% of people who become addicted as opposed to the rest of us who can take a drug and walk away? All right. No one is immediately hooked. No one gets addicted the first time they take it. I've had, I've had people say that. The first time they took cocaine, it was amazing. Uh, but that's actually a myth. No one is immediately hooked but it's because it takes time for these drugs to make changes in the brain. And I'll go down that path in a, a little while. But I want to talk about the temporal nature of addiction. Um, the first time someone takes a drug, generally they either like it or they hate it. If they hate it, that's good news. They're going to stop. They're never going to take it again. If they like it, they might take it again. Or they might have peer pressure or family pressure, other reasons not to take it. Uh, so some people might stop after a few tries. Some people might keep going after a few tries. Over time, and these are not uh, necessarily the second or third time someone takes a drug, but over time, some users will develop withdrawal, as someone mentioned earlier. And withdrawal is that bad feeling when you're trying to stop taking the drug. So if someone stops taking a drug and feels bad, that is withdrawal, but that in itself is not enough to characterize someone with addiction. Uh, anhedonia is another term that we often use. Uh, with opiates and alcohol, there is a physiological withdrawal syndrome. With drugs like cocaine and marijuana, there's an anhedonia, so it's sort of a, a bad feeling. You're not physically sick, but it still is an unpleasant feeling that makes someone want to take the drug again. So when someone, when, when many patients reach that withdrawal anhedonia point, they get the wake-up call that they need and they will stop taking the drug on their own. It might be difficult, but that will be enough of a wake-up call for many patients or many, many users, many experimenters to stop taking the drug. But some, some users will go on beyond that withdrawal and anhedonia stage and develop what we call a compulsive drive to take the drug. That's when the drug taking becomes automatic. The behaviors and the rituals become really automatized in the person's brain and their behavioral rituals. And, and th at that stage is when a patient really, really needs help to stop taking the drug. So that's when we're talking about the most severe addiction, when a patient needs to go to rehab, use Alcoholics Anonymous or some other kind of, of, of external support to get through that addiction. And so there are 
patients and people along every phase of this, this cycle at any point. Um, people can go in and out of these phases of addiction. And um, hopefully, when people get to the most extreme point, they will get help. But I want to, I just wanted to make you aware of the, the lack of immediacy, no one's immediately hooked, and the fact that um, people can be at various points along this progression at any time. So. so the next question that I want to ask is, if there are these varying stages along the pathway from recreational use to addiction, what is it that pushes someone along that pathway and what protects them or discourages them from progressing along that pathway. So I'm going to talk about it in three categories. There are biological, psychological, and sociological factors that determine progression along this pathway from recreational use to addiction. Another side point that I want to make is that none of these biological, psychological, sociological factors are what I would call destiny. These are all probabilistic functions. So there are things that protect you, things that make you more vulnerable to addiction, and in every individual, in those who become addicted, there was probably some perfect storm of these factors. In other people, they may have had one or two of these factors, but they're protected by something else. So none of these factors are destiny. So let's start up. So we, we call this the biopsychosocial model of addiction. So that's the, um, the, the buzzword that you'll hear. And I'm going to start by talking about biological factors. Did I see your hand? Okay. All right. So I'm going to start by talking about biological factors. Um, what we know, this is the, some of the oldest, most well-established research on drugs of, drugs of abuse. All addictive drugs stimulate the neurotransmitter dopamine in the reward center of the brain. So the reward center of the brain, known as the dorsal striatum, this is the nucleus accumbens, ventral tegmental area for you neuroanatomists in the audience. Uh, this reward center of the brain is designed evolutionarily to help us find rewards such as food and sex and help us procreate. This is a very it's sort of primal region of the brain that tells us what's good, what's bad, what should I go back to and what should I avoid. So in this reward center, um, Dopamine is the, the neurotransmitter. And this, this graph here that you can see along the x-axis of this graph is the, which way is it? I forget which way it goes. Yeah, okay, so the, along the x-axis of this graph is the change in dopamine in this dorsal striatum region. On the y-axis of this graph is the self-report of high. So what they did was take a bunch of people who were experienced drug users, some were addicted, some were not, but they knew the difference between a good high and a boring high. So they varied the dose of, uh, the, in this case they used methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, but gave it at a high enough dose so that it could be a high or, or a boring experience. And so they put these uh, individuals, these volunteers into a scanner and and scanned them while they were experiencing the high, and then afterward asked them to say, was that a good high or a boring high? And when they said it was a good high, the dopamine release was really extreme. When they said it was a boring high, there was very little dopamine release. This is one of the, if you're, if you're in science, you know that's a really good correlation. We almost never get data like that in the real world. So this is a really strong correlation to show that dopamine is what is getting someone high. That initial experience of enjoyment of the drug comes from this neurotransmitter dopamine. That's been well established for many years. The other thing, uh, we, we know when we start to look at dopamine, we start to look at the long-term consequences of this dopamine signaling. The other thing that we know is that over time, all addictive drugs change dopamine signaling in the reward center. So this is our body's homeostatic mechanism, or in other words, the way in which our body compensates for this overstimulation of dopamine. So if you're repeatedly taking drugs and repeatedly um, putting all this excess dopamine into this region of your brain, what's going to happen is that the receptors for that dopamine are going to downregulate. They're going to leave the surface of the cells. So your body doesn't like being overstimulated. Your brain doesn't like being overstimulated by dopamine. So those receptors disappear in order to compensate. And you can see in this graph, regardless of the 
uh, the, the class of addictive drugs. So cocaine and meth, the top two are stimulants. The next one is heroin, the bottom one is alcohol. The first column is a control subject. The second column is a drug abusing subject. Age and socioeconomic and educationally level matched controls for, <coughs> excuse me, for the control subject and the drug user. And what you can see is that for all of the drug using, the people on the, the right side of the graph, or the, the image, all of the drug using subjects have fewer dopamine receptors than the control subjects. So over time, this repeated experience of having the drug has reduced the number of dopamine receptors. So what do you think that means for the times in natural life when they need to feel enjoyment of food or sex? What happens to that response now that this downregulation has occurred? Yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just shout it out. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So I saw a downward thumb. Yes, so this is going to remove pleasure from the natural rewards of daily life. So this sets up a vicious cycle. Yes, so this reduced dopamine receptor level is going to lead to reduced reward from natural reinforcers. Did I put my vicious cycle? Yes, I did put my vicious cycle picture in. <laughs> so. so someone... Uh, who has reduced reward sensations from natural rewards is now not going to enjoy real life as much and would then take more addictive drugs to achieve either the same level of high or in many cases the patients begin to need to take addictive drugs just to feel normal again because those those mild enjoyments from everyday life are completely absent so that well I'll, I'll come back to this idea of a vicious cycle a few more times in the talk <clears throat> All right, the other thing that we know biologically is that addiction is at least partly genetic. Uh, addiction runs in families. Uh, children of alcoholics, the, the best data on this topic is from alcohol, because there, there are huge genetic uh, pedigree studies of alcohol. Children of alcoholics are four times more likely to develop alcoholism than, than children of non-alcoholics. And of course, the, the first thing that we think of is that someone growing up in an alcoholic home may not know any other behaviors, and it may be an environmental effect rather than a genetic effect. But even when we look at twin and adoption studies, even when the um, children do not live with the alcoholic parent, that risk of alcoholism is still doubled. So we have both a genetic and an environmental effect going on. So that's why I say addiction is partly genetic, and that evidence mostly comes from alcoholism. Uh, alcohol studies, there are also some for the other drugs of abuse, and it's very much reinforcing the same idea. That addiction is partly genetic, but not exclusively. So again, talking about none of, that none of these factors are destiny, there's one push in, in the direction that comes from our genetics. Uh, there are a few biological factors that are unique to opiates. So the opiate epidemic is so much in the news right now. Um, what is it that is so much more what is it that's making this epidemic so much worse than what we've heard about before? Um, there are a few, there are basically three biological things that make the opiates seem a little bit more addicted, addictive than the other drugs. The first is that there's a strong development of tolerance. Tolerance is the phenomenon by which a person needs more and more of the drug to feel the same high, or if they take the same amount of the drug, they get less and less of a high. So if someone actually wants to get high from heroin, they need to take more and more of the drug. The other phenomenon that's pretty strong with opiates, as we mentioned earlier, is withdrawal. So there's a profound physical sickness that comes along with using opiates regularly and then trying to stop. This is true of patients on cancer pain, low back pain, even a you know, temporary post-surgical opiate use can lead to withdrawal. And many patients need to be gradually weaned off their opiates to avoid this withdrawal. And it, but in, in, the, in the case of addiction, it really complicates that situation when a person might be getting that wake-up call and wanting to stop and realizing that they have a problem, but then they get profoundly physically sick and have a much, much harder time stopping than what you would have with marijuana or cocaine that we saw in previous epidemics. 
Uh, the symptoms of that withdrawal are nausea, diarrhea, pain sensitivity, a general sick or flu-like feeling. So those symptoms are really profound and really do just promote the repeated taking and make it harder for someone to stop. The other factor that's um, really important with the opiate epidemic that's making most of the news now is respiratory depression, which is the cause of death. So um, if, if you see someone, if you hear about people who have died of an opiate overdose, what is happening is that their breathing has slowed to the point of death. So that's, it, the breathing slows to the point where they stop. This is the mechanism of overdose death, and this is how, this is why these things are so much in the news and because they're so deadly. We, di we didn't see that with cocaine or marijuana. Or we don't see that with alcohol either. All right, so those are the biological factors that I wanted to hit on. I'm gonna shift gears now and talk about psychological factors that promote um, the progression from recreational to addicted drug use. Go ahead, wait, hang on. Here comes the microphone. Oh, thank you. I, I'm just wondering, um, you said the breathing gets slower. As people get more and more addicted, do they, is there a slower breathing that they maybe don't notice during that time? How this, does that work? This is actually really fascinating. Uh, I could go on this for a long time, but it's a really interesting aside. So uh, when patients are, when, when users are experienced drug users, when they initiate their drug use rituals, their respiration rate will actually increase. So the body knows I'm about to get my drug and I'm gonna start breathing faster because this drug is about to slow my breathing down. So really experienced drug users who have done a good job of controlling their use over the years, in, in, a little, in some ways are protected uh, if they take a drug that's then more concentrated than they're accustomed to, like we're seeing with fentanyl, then their body might not compensate enough. Um, if they're taking the drug outside of their normal setting so that they don't give their body all the same cues as usual, uh, they, will, they, might, they might not compensate as well, and that's also a mechanism of death. Uh, so, and that, that's one of the ways that the tolerance so that, that breathing, that increased breathing is one form of tolerance that actually is protective for regular drug users. But it, that protection goes away if they change their ritual and routine and setting. Yeah, that's a great question. All right, so shifting into uh, psychological factors now, um, one thing that is really well established from many, many studies is that mood and anxiety disorders double the risk of addiction. So that first set of three columns there, the darkest purple is uh, all, all the, 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 is the um, level of addiction in all uh, respondents combined. So this is um, how many, what percentage of society is addicted to, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> what percentage of the whole society has a mood or an anxiety disorder? So the darkest purple, about 10% of the whole population of the United States has a mood or anxiety disorder at some point in life. If you look at anybody that has any form of drug addiction, those two lighter purple columns, um, the risk, the, the level of mood and anxiety disorders doubles. So there's a high comorbidity between drug addiction, mood anxiety disorders. If you split it, the other uh, clusters are splitting it up by opiates, amphetamines, cocaine. Uh, so the, the percentage of mood and anxiety disorders is always about half in the general population what it is in the drug abusing population. So, mm -hmm. how, do we know that that's, how do we know that that's cause rather than effect? Ex that's where I was, exactly where I was going. So um, we, we call this the self-medication hypothesis. There have been longitudinal epidemiological studies that look at what came first the depression, anxiety, or the drug addiction. And when you do studies from childhood, those, if, you're, if you're knowing what to look for, the mood and anxiety symptoms present before the drug addiction symptoms present. So when those longitudinal studies are done and done very carefully, you can see mood and anxiety symptoms in children before they're starting to take drugs. But very quickly, those depending on other risk factors, if those children, when they become teenagers, start to take drugs of abuse, 
then those drugs of abuse may return those patients or put those patients at a level of mental hedonia, at a level of mental, uh, mental state that is putting them back to normal. So they're, they're, those patients are sort of starting at, the, at one point of the vicious cycle that I showed you earlier. So they already have a lower level of satisfaction from life. And the drugs of abuse put them at that higher level of enjoyment of life and feeds right into that vicious cycle. Right. There certainly are um, withdrawal effects, like with alcohol, depression is certainly a, a withdrawal effect for alcohol, uh, opiates as well, uh, and, and certainly for cocaine and cocaine and marijuana as well. So trying to get clean from drugs and alcohol leads to someone not feeling good and having a lot of anhedonia. So there certainly is depression that results from drug use, but the most severe cases are where the, when the depression and anxiety precedes the drug use, the drug leads to kind of a self-medication, alleviating some of those symptoms of depression and anxiety, feeding into that vicious cycle I talked about earlier. All right. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so we call this the self-medication hypothesis, and this sort of a, a self-pharmacology that people are treating their own symptoms in a way that's harmful, ends up being harmful. Uh, another comorbid factor is untreated ADHD and impulsi impulsivity in general all increase the risk of addiction. So here again, these have been done by longitudinal studies uh, when people look at children and look at just the presence of either an ADHD diagnosis or just a general impulsive behavioral phenotype in the child that increases the risk of addiction. And it seems to be more profound if that ADHD and impulsivity is untreated rather than if it's well treated and well controlled. So here again, um, with stimulants, we see uh, so a different version of the vicious cycle. Um, impulsivity seems to be well tied to stimulant drug taking. Um, for alcohol and opiates, there may be different drivers of the vicious cycle. So pain sensitivity seems to drive the vicious cycle with opiate taking. So someone who has an injury or some other form of pain is more likely to get prescribed opiates, and then in withdrawal, pain sensitivity is increased, so that drives that vicious cycle. With anxiety, with, with alcohol, anxiety is very often a driver. So people who are normally socially anxious uh, find that they're able to have more fun socially when they drink alcohol. That can lead to a vicious cycle of wanting to take more and more. And as I said earlier, none of these are, are you know, destiny, but these are certainly factors that promote repeated drug taking and uh, repeated you know, self-medication and feeling better when you're on the drug, and so these are things that promote the likelihood of addiction. All right, I'm going to spend just a few moments on social factors, and um, I want to do a little bit of differentiation between social factors that promote drug use and social factors that promote drug addiction. So if you think about um, the drugs that are socially acceptable. Obviously in Western society, that is alcohol, because I just stood here and told you that I drink wine, and that is incredibly socially accepted. Uh, so those drugs that are more socially accepted are going to have more, more prevalence in society. Um, one point that, that follows from that uh, is that the number of alcoholics in our society dwarfs the number of all other drug addictions combined. So if you add up all the cocaine, heroin, and that is still true with the current opiate epidemic. Add up all the other forms of drug addiction, it's still dwarfed by the number of alcoholics. Uh, so that accepted cultural norm, social acceptability, um, is very much promoting drug use, and the more use you have, the more addiction you'll have. Uh, a couple of other things that um, promote drug use are stress coping norms and expectations. So if you think that it's normal, and everybody's gonna have a beer after a hard day at work, then that's probably what's going to happen, and that's gonna make those drugs more or less prevalent in society. If you're in a culture where everyone thinks that all pain should be medicated, and no one should have the slightest hint of pain for any, any wound, then we're gonna have more opiates prescribed, we're gonna have more pills out there in the world, and th then we're gonna have more addiction. But these are only the things 
at, the, at first step, these are the things that promote drug use. What are the things that promote addiction in those users? This is one example that's really well established um, that I want to touch on. This is a list of, this is called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Questionnaire. Um, these are things that contribute to the risk of addiction. So think in your mind, um, at, when you were a child, did any adult in your household ever insult or humiliate you, threaten you, slap, grab, or hit you, sexually abuse you, make you feel unloved or unworthy? In your household as a child, did you ever go without food, clothing, or shelter? Did you ever even witness abuse? Did you experience separation or divorce? Did you experience others with alcoholism, addiction, or mental illness? Or did anyone ever go to prison? Now, none of these things are particularly rare. Many of us could say yes to one or two of these things. For every yes to one of these adverse childhood experiences, someone becomes two to four times more likely to initiate drug use before the age of 14. Uh, at any point in life, it makes them more likely to initiate drug use, drug problems, or addiction. And those patients with more than five yeses to these adverse experience questionnaires um, become seven to ten times more likely to develop drug problems and addiction. So you see that these um, childhood experiences that are completely beyond the control of the child and not terribly rare in our society go on to have a really profound effect on the effect that drugs of abuse can have when that child becomes a teenager or an adult. So, yes? Thank you. We, we know from other research that stressors like all the things that you listed there also have physical effect on the brain. You can put those same people in a scanner and see the same kind of damage to their dopamine receptors and other parts of the brain. What's the interplay between those? To what extent are these completely independent of physical changes or versus just another dimension of physical changes? Oh, I would say that it's basically just another dimension of physical changes. Yeah, those, those stressors, yeah, the, the, they're very much in the same parallel pathways. A lot of the research is looking at the same things. Um, we can do the same things in animals. Stressors to animals will promote drug taking uh, so, yeah, it's, it's very much shared pathways. Mm -hmm. So, to summarize, I would say that the efforts to escape negative emotions or experiences or to approach rewarding or positive experiences or a drug high all lead to increased drug use. And the more drugs are used, the more likely a person is to experience addiction. So, if we have this biopsychosocial problem, we need to have biopsycho and social solutions to address it. So, just briefly, those three, in those three areas, to treat the biological side of addiction, we do have medication assisted treatment. So there is You've heard of, you've probably heard of methadone. Now we have um, suboxone, buprenorphine for opiate addiction. Uh, so we have a little bit of forms of medication assisted treatment. The way that all, not all, the way that most medication assisted treatment works is to alleviate those symptoms of withdrawal. That's especially true for the opiates. Methadone, suboxone, um, all of those medications are basically alleviating that physically sick flu-like withdrawal syndrome so that the patient can at least get through their day and start to rebuild a better life. Um, for It's the same, same um, biological concept as we use like the nicotine patch or uh, Chantix. All of those are nicotine substitution methods to help someone quit smoking. And basically the same thing is happening. If someone has withdrawal when they try to stop smoking, those medications will alleviate that withdrawal and help them to form other habits and find better things to do on their five minute break. Instead of taking a five minute smoke break, let's do something else. So the, the biological solutions to addiction mostly address those withdrawal symptoms. There are also, of course, psychological symptoms and those are generally aimed at treating those underlying co comorbidities. So depression, anxiety, uh, other, um, 
in harmful ways of thinking are often treated by cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, relapse prevention therapy. So there's a lot of ways to help the patients identify their triggers, the things that make them crave their drugs of abuse, and help them to avoid those triggers. So there's a lot of, <clears throat> there are some good psychological approaches that are really well shown to work. Uh, but then finally, none of these are effective without social change. So people need a reason to get up and do something other than get high all the time. Um, they need to establish healthy friendships, family relationships, meaning and purpose, a reason to get up and go to work instead of get up and get high every day. And so these social solutions are much more broad societally, in some ways much more difficult to identify because they take a whole lot more uh, effort on the part of both the patient and their support structure. So um, if many of you may be familiar with TROSA in Durham, their Triangle Residential Options for Substance Abusers, it's a residential community that um, takes, it's completely free for the patients, and they spend two years in residence uh, learning how to have the discipline to get up and go to work every day and have work that has meaning to them, and then have the, the resources to start out on their own at the end of two years so that when they do get a job, they, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not uh, immediately, their money's not immediately spent, they've got enough to get an apartment, so sorts of things. So that, that social structure of having friends who aren't using and having a job and having a reason to get up and go to work every day is the more complex thing, the more difficult thing to solve, but it's absolutely necessary to have long-term recovery. So that was the last thing that I was going to say. And uh, so thank you guys for coming, and now we can take as many questions as you like. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> All right. So yeah, we're going to do widespread Q&A this time. So if you ha do have questions or think of a question in a couple of minutes, throw up your hand, uh, flag down myself or Katie. We're going to try to get to as many of your questions as we can tonight. And I think... Katie's going to start right there, but we'll bring microphones around. That way everybody can hear. Uh, I think I have two questions. One is the parallel, um, if people quit smoking, their lung cells heal, I understand. Hey, so if people quit smoking, their lungs get better. Yes. In the picture where you showed the normal brains where the dopamine sites, if someone's a chronic user for 30, 40 years and quits, mm -hmm. do those receptors pop back up and replenish themselves? Yes, they actually do. There was a study done by some folks at Wake Forest, and they used subjects from TROSA. So uh, the patients, the way, the way it turned out was that the patients who were successful in recovery from TROSA had those dopamine receptors returned to normal. So they did and, and early recovery and late. I have a second FFT. question. <laughs> okay, my second question is, there was an excellent presentation on nicotine, and they showed all the primitive pathways that went way back way back uh, evolutionarily. Mm -hmm. do, these, do these pleasure pathways, how far back do they go evolutionarily? Can oh, I? Yeah, these are like our very primitive regions of the brain. Um, this, in, in all mammals, these regions of the brain are present, so uh, yeah, it's the very necessary for survival. Feeling good, food's over here, go back over here for food the next day, regions of the brain. Mm -hmm. One, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I do a lot of work in the opioid overdose prevention programs, and one of the more challenging questions I get is why would one use medicated assisted treatment and simply give someone who is addicted a, an opioid for some amount of time to the rest of their lives. Can you give me a cogent response to that question? Yes, I can. Thank you for asking. Yes, so uh, when someone is, especially when someone is very early in recovery, uh, that withdrawal, it, it clearly if they want to be in recovery, they're clearly motivated. But that withdrawal can really impede the recovery process. So all those drugs, the, the suboxone, the methadone, those drugs are alleviating that withdrawal. And that's the only thing we have that successfully alleviates that withdrawal. So if you can alleviate that withdrawal, 
then you free the patient up to build a better life and you know, find a job, reconnect with their family, all those other things. Uh, so that's the number one thing. The other thing, I had another thought, I can't think what it was. That's the main thing, it's because it's alleviating withdrawal. Now, so many patients want to wean themselves off those medications over time, and for many patients that works over time. For some, it doesn't. And so we need to start thinking about drug addiction as a chronic illness, as I said at the beginning. And if someone has diabetes, you wouldn't want to wean them off of insulin. And so uh, if, if you have a patient who cannot be weaned off methadone, yet they've got a job and they're taking care of their kids and they're doing really well on their methadone, I think that's a win. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you. Uh -huh. You re sort of hinted around at socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. How big a contributor to the addiction problem is that? It's, yeah, it's fascinating. So there's some great data that I didn't put in this slide deck. Um, it's, it varies by substance. So alcohol right now is much more of a high socioeconomic problem, particularly among teenagers. Uh, smoking is much more of a low socioeconomic problem. Uh, the opiate epidemic is that, again, this is so much in the news, really seems to be a transitional socioeconomic problem. If you look at a lot of the county by county across the whole United States epidemiological data, the place where the opioid epidemic is the worst is in counties that used to have really stable manufacturing or mining jobs. Think about how this started in Appalachia and the Rust Belt. Places that used to have really stable physical labor kinds of jobs, those jobs went away and you're in a culture that's accustomed to having physical pain and accustomed to having, uh, needing that kind of treatment. Now those jobs are gone the next generation is accustomed to having pain pills around but doesn't have a reason or doesn't have an opportunity to get up and go to work in the morning anymore. So from the generation of the parents who had good jobs but always had to take pain pills, now the children don't have good jobs but still take pain pills. So that, that transition socioeconomically seems to be where the opioid epidemic started. It spread beyond that, but that's where it seems to be. That's where the socioeconomic impetus started. So one of the concerns that we're seeing a lot in the news lately is how we can appropriately legislate prescription drug uh, distribution. And it's one of the things that I think makes it more difficult to legislate than say heroin or other opiates that are not available via prescription. Mm -hmm. So obviously I think it's pretty clear that prison is not an effective drug abuse treatment program, right. but how do we appropriately legislate drug use so that people can get the treatment that they need. Right, um, so, so are you talking about, I thought you were going a different direction. Are you, you're asking about what to do about people who have an addiction rather than send them to jail? Right. Okay, I thought you were asking about what to do about doctors prescribing too many, but I'll, we, can, we can talk about that later. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I, maybe I'm Pollyanna hippie liberal, uh, but I think that the best way to reduce the um, opioid epidemic is to increase treatment resources. And, you know, if, if someone commits a crime and is otherwise a danger to society, they probably need to go to jail, but we could, even in jail, we could do a whole lot better job of having prison treatment systems. Um, but for someone who is not otherwise dangerous, whose only crime is selling and seeking and taking drugs and being high in public, those kind of of citizens need help and need drug treatment and, and those, those resources are very, very underfunded and under prevalence in our society. Um, the, I, I forget the statistic exactly, but probably about 10% of people who meet the diagnostic criteria for addiction have access to, to resources. To treatment resources. So we can do, a, the first step would be to just make treatment resources more readily available, to train family care physicians, to recognize it and refer or do, um, if someone is not too far down the path of addiction, uh, family doctors, um, other 
leaders in, in our society can do a lot to intervene and say, hey, I think you're having a problem. Let's, let's get you the help that you need or let's just give you the wake-up call that you need. So I think we could do a lot more on the treatment side and the incarceration clearly has not worked for decades. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess it's uh, fair to say that uh, alcohol and marijuana are more socially acceptable in this country and Absolutely. I guess more available. I don't Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Uh, alcohol, certainly. Uh, one of the arguments that I, I've always heard about uh, against legalizing marijuana is because it's a gateway to something more serious. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is there evidence that that's the case? Yeah, so the gateway hypothesis, had, uh, it, it gained traction for a while, and the thinking right now is it's pretty well disproven. Um, if there is a gateway, it's very sociological. So uh, being in contact, you know, if, if marijuana is illegal to buy, yet it's sociologically acceptable, um, you know, then someone has to go into an illegal situation to buy marijuana, and lo and behold, cocaine and heroin are there too. Um, but the evidence does not suggest that just because someone tries marijuana that they're that much more likely to go on and try the others. Uh, the other factors that I showed today, like depression, anxiety, uh, childhood trauma, all of those things are way more predictive of who is going to use those harder drugs than just the taking of marijuana. So when we, when we account for all those other factors, that's much more of a driver than the exposure to marijuana. Uh, the other, we're in a grand societal experiment right now with like Colorado and Washington, the states that have, all those other states that have recently legalized marijuana. The preliminary data, and this is really preliminary, so I'm not putting too much stock in it, but the pr preliminary data says that there's not that much of an increase in addiction. Um, I think they're probably will be over time just because alcohol is so much more prevalent, therefore alcoholism is so much more prevalent. I think if marijuana becomes more, that much more prevalent, I think the addiction will become that much more prevalent. And there again, we need to have, we can say, we can spend our money, the revenue that comes in from marijuana sales on treatment and probably still end up ahead in revenue. So. That's the, those are, but again, we're in a really grand experiment in society right now. So I don't know how it's gonna turn out. We'll see. <laughs> uh? Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. It's uh, very informative. Uh, so one question that I had was pertaining to something you mentioned earlier about these other types of uh, addictions besides drugs. Uh, so behaviors that can be reward centric. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, have you studied the brain at all um, at for these other types of behavioral rewards and does our brain respond similarly as when we're rewarded by drugs as we are with other addictive behaviors? Absolutely, yes. So there's a growing body of literature looking at uh, gambling is the big one, uh, that gambling lights up the same dopamine reward symptom, syndrome, centers as drugs of abuse, uh, compulsive shopping, nymphomania, um, what are the other? Those are the big ones. Uh, those and compulsive overeating, not just not just like uh, endocrinological obesity, but compulsive overeating is also driven by the same reward centers in the brain. So yeah, there's a growing body of literature that's showing that it, at least that first step of getting a high from dopamine, like we see with drugs, it's the same reaction comes along with those behaviors. We also see a phenomena of tolerance. So you'll see that gamblers increase their, um, their need, their, the amount of money they need to bet or the, the thrill of the games that they choose. So that same, the same phenomena of tolerance and withdrawal happen with those behaviors as well. Hmm? Uh, you mentioned uh, Marika's grand experiment. Um, Holland's actually had that same experiment going for what, 30 mm -hmm. years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I and mean, how has it gone over there? There must be some data by now on that. The, um, the best data that I know of is from Portugal, um, because Portugal went from a very sort of uh, carefully controlled society like we had, and it's been about 20 years now since Portugal went down the route of not quite legalization, but that um, minor possession was 
considered a misdemeanor and that repeated possession was uh, treated with uh, enforced uh, drug treatment and um, yeah, those are the main things. So they took, they took away all jail time related to simple drug use. And um, the drug problem has actually gone down, even though they legalized everything. Their, the amount of use did not go up much at all. It did initially, but it's really leveled out. Um, but the addiction rate went way down because they're getting treatment. So Portugal is the best example of that. Um, and the drug use pretty much stayed flat, but the addiction went down. So that, to me, is really powerful. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One is um, what proportion of opioid deaths comes from fentanyl? And number two, is it as really as concentratedly dangerous as I read in the media where, you know, like two crystals of the straight stuff would yeah. kill you? <laughs> yes. So uh, I am working with a team of students that's mapping the fentanyl deaths in North Carolina. Um, the, I think the, the proportion of drug overdose deaths that are fentanyl is growing because it's getting more and more prevalent. And it varies from city to city, like Wilmington for a long time was the hub. It's spreading across the state. Um, I can't, I don't, I honestly don't know the percentage of overall deaths that's fentanyl. I'm guessing around 10%, but it's growing and it's varying. So that's changing over time. Uh, and yes, so the pharmacological action of fentanyl is different from heroin and Percocet and Oxycontin in that it binds more tightly to the mu opioid receptor and it, um, that's the main thing. It binds more tightly and it's harder for it to get knocked off of the receptor by naloxone, which is the rescue drug that you might have heard of, Narcan or naloxone. So fentanyl binds more tightly and is harder to knock off the receptor. Therefore, it does its respiration depression activity a whole lot more strongly and causes death. So yeah, that is true pharmacologically. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi. In the early part of your talk, you showed a slide with the percentage of addictions for people who once tried. Where does nicotine fall on that? <laughs> I leave nicotine off of there because the, um, the, the definition is a little bit different. Right. Um, about 20% of people who ever smoke a cigarette go on to become regular smokers. Um, but the data aren't good as to are those pack-a-day smokers or only when I drink on Friday night smokers. Uh, so 20% is the number, but I think that's artificially high because we also don't have the same criteria of, you know, compulsively to the detriment of your life and, and ignoring your children for cigarette smoking. Yes, it's going to kill you long term, but it's not as short term behaviorally detrimental. So that's why I, I didn't include the data for cigarettes, but it, it's 20%, but that's fudgy. And one other thing, you talked about the genetic component. Mm -hmm. If someone has two parents mm -hmm. who were drug users, mm -hmm. are they more likely to be drug users than people who only had one parent? Yep, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and there have also been studies done um, where there's a great study, I think it's out of Australia, where there's like a, a drug using father who was then divorced out of the home and then the child was raised either by a drug using mother and a stepfather or non drug using. But bottom line is, yeah, more genetic load leads to more uh, risk and every little bit of that you take out alleviates that risk. So yeah. I'd like you to step back again to marijuana. Mm -hmm. A uh, talk that I heard this morning suggested that marijuana is not only a gateway to opioid use, but it is also a precursor to schizophrenia and um, bipolar disease. I had never heard that, and I would like your take on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the gateway thing, I'm still skeptical on. Like, like I said, that was, um, that hypothesis was explored many years ago and it's pretty much out of favor. Um, the schizophrenia psychosis angle, uh, I think the data for that are pretty convincing. So um, 
marijuana can exacerbate what it can what it can do rather than explicitly cause schizophrenia is that it can bring it on and exacerbate it. So someone who might be prodromal schizophrenic, you know, just beginning to show symptoms, if they start to self-medicate with marijuana, that's going to accelerate the progression so that you see that schizophrenia more quickly. Uh, someone who's not otherwise at risk for schizophrenia is not going to become schizophrenic just from smoking marijuana. But if they have those genetic risk factors for schizophrenia, it can be accelerated. The acceleration into showing symptoms can happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, are males more predisposed to addiction? <laughs> for a long time, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at the, you know, the gender differences in addiction. Um, it, it is looking like, there are sort of several answers to that question. It's looking like uh, there Mostly the increased prevalence in males is sort of social factors. It was very much socially frowned on for a, a woman to smoke or drink or take drugs. There was the macho coolness aspect that promoted more men taking drugs and smoking and all those things. So, but those gender differences are disappearing in our society. So things that might have been true, my generation, your generation, where it was shunned in women, those differences are going away. So what we're seeing is more equal development in both sexes now in the younger generation. The other thing, the other phenomenon that's kind of interesting but hasn't quite been figured out is that in women who become addicted, the progression from first taking a drug to meeting those criteria for addiction is accelerated. We call this a telescoping effect. So it might take men 10 years to go from recreational use to addiction. It might take a woman three years. Um, so that's pretty well established, but again, the mechanism is not well known. Is that because women will just admit that there's a problem sooner or because they have more responsibility Abilities with childbearing, and again, these are all averages, so we don't know in any one person. Is that because they have more responsibilities with child, therefore it's a problem sooner, whereas the men can, you know, just walk away? Um, yes, yeah, so the short answer is that many of the gender differences are disappearing because of sociological factors, but that there still are some biological factors that we're still working to figure out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, so drug policy, especially at the federal level, and this is not a partisan statement, this is something that's been true for decades. Drug policy seems to be completely divorced from the science of, that you've been talking about this evening. And thank you, by the way. Um, why is that, and what can we do about it? <laughs> I'm going to keep talking, and that's, that's what we're doing now. I think um, if you look back at a lot of the history of our drug policy. Um, there's some good evidence now that if you look at when the war on drugs was uh, started in the Nixon administration, there was a lot of science policy that said this doesn't need to be illegal, this needs to have treatment. Um, you know, heroin, heroin was first marketed by the Bayer Aspirin Company because it cured coughs and uh, whooping cough or pertussis was the most common um, illness at the time. And it worked, but then people realized it got you addicted. So addiction has always been around. And at different phases in our culture, um, the laws about drug addiction have been used racially. So it's always people of brown skin or foreign, you know, different immigration, immigrant groups seem to have been demonized in the different phases of the war on drugs. Um, so right now, we can say it out loud, this, the opiate epidemic is hitting a white middle class population and everybody's awake and everybody wants to fix this. So my hope is that we would use this opportunity to say all, all addictions for all these hundreds of years have always been based in the brain, based in things that are beyond the control of the patient. And so let's take that science-based approach and do what's right for the patients. Um, I can only hope that. Maybe it's hippie liberal Pollyanna, but that's, I'm, I'm going to keep talking about that. Thank you. Let's give her a round of applause again. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to the Science Cafe. Thanks for sharing. And 
Thanks to all of you for coming out tonight, for hopefully enjoying and learning a lot and taking home a lot to think about from tonight's Science Cafe All About Addiction. Thank you for participating in events here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. Don't forget the next Thursday night, we won't be here in the cafe, we'll be in the WRAL 3D Theater over in the other building on the first floor. So make sure that you go in the original main entrance of the museum and visit us for How to Tame a Fox with Lita Gakin. And have a great Thursday night, everybody. Travel safe. <laughs>